Welcome. Good afternoon. It's absolutely beautiful sight to see a room packed right now. Thank you all for coming. We're going to keep having folks filter in and hopefully not get fire department anywhere near us <laughs> as we engage in this awesome space for the next about hour and a half. Um, I'd like to welcome you and introduce Dean Larry Flip, who will give us a few words. Yeah, thank you. Um, I too am very gratified that we uh, have such an attendance here. This is, this is great. Um, I would, uh, if I were to list the three or four topics that the leadership of the university uh, spends most time on, um, race and race relationships, uh, equity and inclusion, would be right there at the top. So um, the university as, I guess, is society as a whole is looking at um, the need for a huge change. Presumably we are looking at it happening, but in um, recognizing that we need institutional and for that matter personal capacity to um, address the diversity in our society in a better way. And we are very pleased to have, have Dr. Turner here today. And uh, I will turn this over to Lucy to introduce you. So here's the formal part of this very informal presentation. So this is Dr. Lopez de Leon Cabrera. He is visiting us from the University of Arizona, where he currently, I'm sorry? <laughs> He's visiting us from the University of Arizona, where he is currently an assistant professor in the Center for the Study of Higher Education. And he researches there the impact of New Start Summer Program, the impact that it has on low-income first-generation and racial minority college students there. Prior to his appointment at U of A, he earned his PhD from the UCLA's Higher Education and Organizational Change Program there. His dissertation titled, Indivisible Racism, Male Hegemonic Whiteness in Higher Education, Critically Analyzed White Male Undergraduate Racial Ideology. Dr. Cabrera's primary research interests include race, racism in higher education, whiteness formation, diversity, and affirmative action. Dr. Cabrera's article, articles have appeared in the Review of Higher Ed, the Journal of Latinos in Education, the Journal of Higher Education, Race, Ethnicity, and Education, Research in Higher Education, and the Journal of, most recently, the Journal of College Student Development as well as others. He earned his Bachelor of Arts from Stanford University in comparative studies in race and ethnicity, and is originally from McMinnville, Oregon. <laughs> As I just found out, he was also the first Latino student body president at the high school there. So welcome me, help me welcome Dr. Noah Thank you. Well, thank you so much for having me here. This is, this is wow. Uh, I'm looking around the room and uh, you know, I said, wow, this is awesome having so many people packed in here on a Thursday afternoon, bright eyed, bushy tailed. I expect this sort of that 2 30 feeling. And, uh, and I'm like, yeah, all right, we're going to have a great time. We're going to hopefully have a lot of, throw a lot of thought provoking thoughts around, uh, have a lot of engagement. Um, but first of all, I do want to say thank you uh, to everybody who made this possible. Obviously, the sponsorship of the College of Education and the Difference Power and Discrimination Program at Oregon State. And then the who's the fearsome four some? So Adam, Lucy, Nana, where did Alicia go? Did she, oh, there she is. Uh, and, and they were instrumental in, in putting this together, organizing it, so that all I had to do was show up here, have my presentation ready, and here we're ready to go. But as I said, it's not just a homecoming for me coming back to the valley and I live in the downtown uh, in Arizona. But I mean, my dad is a graduate of Oregon State University. I was going to Oregon State. In or probably a lot of people born. Um, and so this is a, it really is, and you brought the beautiful weather. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And in a weird way, being in the desert, I'm like, okay, this is really cool. I know y'all are like, I'm so tired of this, give me some sunshine, but I'm like, oh, it's been sunny, it's 60 and 70. And anyway, but you didn't come here to hear me wax nostalgic about being from the valley. What we're gonna talk about, we're gonna talk about some uh, race, whiteness, and relationships to education. And uh, I was, I, this talk got posted on Facebook, race is not a four letter word, and uh, a colleague of ours from UCLA, Mike Knox, said, dude, your title is demonstrably false. That's 
wrong. I'm like, no kidding, exactly. But it was supposed to um, address this issue that we treat race like a four-letter word, that it's a dirty word, that we don't talk about, that we don't engage with it. We have this idea that in some respects, if we could just sort of forget about it, it would just go away. And a lot of what I'm going to talk about today is both A, why that's counterproductive, and B, how we can actually start critically engaging. Because if we can pretend that race doesn't matter, but it's still going to matter. And so basically color blindness is only a form of color ignorance. And I, the comedian Hari Kondabola actually addressed this because he's consistently accused of injecting race into the situation. Why are you always talking about race? Why are you always doing this? Why are you obsessed with race? And his simple retort is pretty profound. Isn't it? Saying I'm obsessed with race and racism in America is like saying I'm obsessed with swimming while drowning. It's absolutely absurd. And I love that contradiction because it, it actually flips the script on the problem. Instead of saying that I'm injecting race in the situation, it's saying, no, race is already there. And by me addressing it, that's exactly what I'm doing, is addressing it. But before that, I wanted to start off with this idea of whiteness, because actually whiteness is what I study. Because in reality, that's what we're talking about, and that's what we really never talk about. I mean, raise your hand if you've been in a diversity conversation and somebody started actually talking about whiteness. A couple, exactly. It's usually we talk about, oh, there's a diversity conversation, it's people of color. Oh, there's a diversity issue on campus. Oh, someone talked mess about Mexicans in the, in the in the cafeteria. I mean, there's an implicit assumption that that's what we're talking about. So, what is whiteness? How did it form? Where did it begin? Well, in the formation of the country, it actually didn't exist. This concept of whiteness, it wasn't in existence in the way that we know it today. And in reality, what happened was that you had uh, uh, impoverished white folk who were given a certain amount of token inclusion into the social hierarchy so that they wouldn't rebel against the landowning elite. They were given positions that would put them ahead of black people, ahead of native people, ahead, well, Latinos weren't even in consideration at that point. But <coughs> they would have a situation, and it was really experimented by Bacon's Rebellion, where slowly but surely, poor whites were given token incorporation. They were, they were said, at least you're not black. You'll be white, at least you're not black. And I think that that's, a, that's an important history to remember because it relates very directly to the way that we talk about race in a contemporary context. Oh, and by the way, if I do use, I do use a lot of pop culture references, please don't say, interpret that to mean that I wholeheartedly endorse everything that this person has said in their entire life. I understand Richard Pryor is a very problematic comedian, but he still said some pretty profound things in the process. Okay? So just keep that as a footnote in the back of your head if you're like, dude, that guy has said some messed up things. I know he said messed up things. <laughs> so when we have racial conversations, I always hear this nonsensical false equivalency that poor white trash is the equivalent of saying yes. It's not. For the precise reason of the N-word, and I, and I feel obliged to say it as the N-word, not to sort of take the sting out of it, but because as a Latino man, I can't know the sting of that word. I can't fundamentally know what that's like. I can't know the dehumanization that occurs as a result of being targeted by that word. And so as a consequence, I have really no right to explore or play with it. That's not my positionality to do. But the reason why these are not synonymous terminologies or moral equivalent terminologies is that poor white trash means you did not live up to the expectation of your whiteness. You did not rise to the level of society that you should have given your racial social standing. The N-word is intentionally meant to dehumanize, to say you are not a person. And that's where Richard Pryor came in. He said if, you're, if you get in a fight with another man, it's stuff, get, uh, he, he didn't say stuff, gets <laughs> rough, and, you, and, and, and he ends up calling you the N-word. And then you're like, oh, shoot, fudge. <laughs> he says, now I ain't a man no more. And that's the essence of it. Now I ain't no man no more. I'm not a person. You're not talking to a person. Now don't get it twisted. I don't want you know, the, 
I don't want it to show up in the daily barometer tomorrow. University of Arizona professor says it's okay to say poor white trash. No, no, no. I, 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 that's not what, don't, don't get twisted, that's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is that the way we colloquially talk about this is that, oh yeah, you know, this slur is this and this slur is that and they're all equivalent. I'm saying absolutely not. Larry Wilmore had a great bit on that in the Daily Show where John Stewart said, hey, is it alright for white people to use the N-word? No. It's like, could you expand on that? Maybe give a longer answer? Sure. Sure. No. <laughs> and so I, I think that you know that, that we need to keep that in mind that, that in many respects when we talk about race, we tend to try to forget that the past ever happened. And in many respects, that's what I'm trying to remind us today, that we can't really engage the present and, the, and create the future if we don't actually engage that past. So, back to the formation of whiteness. W.B. Du Bois, one of the foremost uh, sociologists, well, ever, and one of the greatest brilliant minds that the U.S. has ever produced, um, <coughs> really wrote about uh, Reconstruction in particular uniting uh, in the South poor white and, and, and affluent white in terms of being in opposition to blacks and black men. And what he described in, 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 in his book, Reconstruction, which, by the way, is something like 700 pages long that was written in a time where we didn't have MacBooks, which, excuse me, I don't want to write 700 pages right now. And he was doing it way back then. But in his analyses, <coughs> he talked about white people, in particular poor white people, receiving a public and psychological wage of whiteness, which essentially meant that in that time, I may be poor, I may be downtrodden, I may not have land, I may be in difficult circumstances, but at least I'm not black. And so he, he also elaborated on this theme in his book, The Souls of White Folk, that specifically addressed, and this is really the beginning of, of what we call critical whiteness studies. It was within this paradigm that James Baldwin uh, wrote that as long as you think you are white, there is no hope for you. This was a racial paradigm that specifically said that whiteness was equated with superiority. Whiteness meant to be genetically superior, ideologically superior. It, it, it was an ideology that permeated that said that the white man, and white man in particular, because remember back in these days that the woman's place was in the home, women couldn't vote until 1920, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but that, <coughs> uh, excuse me, it was, a, it was a totalitarian regime of racial control. Jim Crow South, no, you know, blacks are over here, whites are over here, complete and total separation. And so, buying into that, basically, you lose your humanity as long as you think you're white, there is no hope for you. As a quick aside, if you haven't read The Fire Next Time, it's one of the most beautiful pieces of American literature ever written. Take the time to do it, you won't regret it. It's, it's like, it'll make you cry, it's so beautiful. It's painful, but it's beautiful at the same time. I also had this tendency to kind of go on tangents, as you'll see. It's like, it's like that movie Up with the dog, he's like, yes, master, uh, squirrel. And so if I, if I squirrel a little bit too much, I apologize. I'm uh, running off of very little sleep on a three-year-old son, so I'm like, woohoo. <laughs> now, how did whiteness continue evolving? Well, because there's, there's, there's always these debates, well, you know, hey, you know, the, the, the Irish were treated terribly, the Italians, the Jews, when they immigrated from Europe, they made it, so why can't Latinos? Well, there's a very simple reason for that. that and there's a number of histories that have documented this, of how previously racialized Eastern European immigrants, in particular, became white. And it was essentially a two-fold process. The first part was giving up all native culture, that is, Lose your accent, lose, you know, lose, lose any visible markers that distinguish you from being what's called, quote, white and implicitly American, which I always have problems with that terminology. And over time, these groups were able to perfectly assimilate. That is, you can walk down the campus right now, and it's really hard to tell if someone is German, Swedish, uh, Jewish, uh, Irish, Italian, you might have a little inkling here or there, but fundamentally, it's just this, it, it, it's, a, it's a monolith. And this is not a path that's offered to, uh, that, that's offered to uh, racialized people, essentially Asian Americans, Latinos, Native Americans, African Americans. 
because I mean, if you can give up your native culture, but you don't have the way to it's about external treatment. You can't actually completely assimilate because people won't treat you as a good white woman. And what that means today is that whiteness in many respects is kind of an empty social category. It doesn't represent a culture. It doesn't, like I can say, okay, what are some good things about being Latino? Okay, well, you know, the food, the dress, the family, the, you know, I can point to things like that. It's sort of like, well, what's good about being white? I don't get pulled over by the police as much, you know? <laughs> Stop and frisk doesn't apply to me. Uh, you know, stand your ground. I'm probably going to be found, you know, innocent. I mean, I know there's kind of like a half. Uh, and, uh, too soon. Or, you know. um, but that's the point: is is that whiteness was necessarily created in opposition to something. It wasn't what whiteness necessarily stood for. It was that it stood in opposition to blackness. But then the problem is, is that you have a lot of white kids running around today who don't have a sense of who they are and where they come from. They don't have a sense of their native culture because, in many respects, their ancestors made a Faustian bargain that said, okay, cool, in, 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 in the terms of the promise of climbing the social ladder, I'm going to give up part of who I am, part of my culture. And what that manifested in a, in a lot of contemporary ways is white people turning to interpretations of native ceremony and drum circles, which drives me nuts. Uh, you know, the, the simple phenomenon of white young men, young teenage men in particular, trying to act black. And I love that title, Everything But the Burden. I can sag my pants, I can adopt a dress, I can listen to the music, but again, I don't have the adverse treatment of being black. Then you have some really insidious ones like racial theme parties. And part of the reason why racial theme parties come up is because people who don't have necessarily a strong connection to the native culture don't think that there's anything wrong with A, appropriating another culture and be acting in a racist way because they don't have the same investment in their own native culture. And then this was once the funny, uh, you know, attempt at a music video that was, you know, again, just native appropriation and, and is kind of disgusting and eventually got pulled back up. So I've been talking a lot about whiteness in the past, but really there's, there's a critical piece of history that we also miss. And that was that the 1960s really did transform a lot of things. Not the way most people think. Most people think, okay, you know, Martin Luther King had a dream, and, you know, everyone, forever to the Board of Education passed, and cool, now we're, we don't have to think about race anymore. It's not that simple. The 1960s were an incredibly important time where, in particular, the idea of whiteness was destabilized. Remember I was talking about the ideological construct of whiteness, that is, whiteness being inherently superior? Well, part of the power of the 1960s was that simply couldn't be, that, 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 that form of racism essentially started to fall out of favor little by little. White people couldn't walk around and being like, well, I am inherently superior because I'm white. And the 1960s were, were incredibly important in, 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 in destabilizing that. The problem was that systemically, racial privilege and racial domination didn't really fundamentally change. It transformed. It went from de jure to de facto. That is, it went from, you know, it went from state sanction legalized segregation to one where segregation still exists and there's still racial power, but it's more as a matter of informal laws of society as opposed to formalized laws of society. In many respects, some of the work that's been coming out of the Civil Rights Institute at now UCLA, formerly at Harvard, indicates that school level segregation in many urban environments is actually greater now than it was prior to Brown versus the Board of Education uh, being uh, read into law. We wrap your head around that. That's how, because people think, oh, you know, look, they're all integrated and we can all this. In many respects, those are, those are mythologies. They don't represent the realities of what's going on. And what that means also is that I, I, I kind of make an analogy with racism uh, to capitalism. Because all too often we think racism, oh, you know, this person doesn't like someone of a different race, or they don't like someone of a different color skin, and that's racism. Well, yeah, and if I'm talking to my three-year-old, that's, that's a good definition of racism. But that's insufficient if we're having a more sophisticated conversation. The reason why I talk about it as a system, and I make sort of akin to capitalism, is that many of us are also complicit in it. It's not a function of 
you know, well, you're a really good person, you have good thoughts, and you're a really bad person, you have bad thoughts, it, it's, that's too simplistic. It's more that we're all participating in a system of racism that perpetuates the privileges of whiteness and the domination of people of color. In the same way that in capitalism, whether you're rich or poor, we're still participating in the system. It's just that people of the what we call the 1% have a greater ability to determine which direction we're going. So <coughs> really what fundamentally happened in the 60s was that whiteness was re-articulated from socially explicitly dominant to socially normal. And what do I mean by that? So what month are we in? Thank you very much. Wow, you jumped ahead. I was actually going to have to go February, then Black History Month. All right, you get a, you get a little smiley face. Um, Black History Month. And why would we need Black History Month? Because black folk were written out of the history books. They've been written out of the history books. And one little checkbox in a history book that has Martin Luther King, and then, you know, Rosa Parks sat in a, in, in a bus, as wouldn't give up or see the bus. That is not meaningful inclusion. And so, really, what we're talking about is not that February is Black History Month, it's that March, April, May, June, July, those are White History Month. But we, we don't talk about it like that. It's an invisible, it's normal. That's just history. We talk about ethnic studies, women's studies, LGBTQ studies. But that means that the regular studies, regular history, doesn't incorporate these viewpoints in its normal canon. And so it, 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 we had this weird way of twisting our language to actually intentionally go to, that, to misrepresent what we're talking about. We're talking about history. No, no, we're not, I mean, if we were actually being accurate, we call it exclusionary history. Wealthy, landowning, heterosexual male history. But if, if we're being accurate with it. And then the ones that are actually inclusive of the views of women and the poor and racial minorities and the LGBTQ community, that would be considered history. But do you see how we twist it just based on that assumption of whiteness and its normality? Another example, and again, just because I put someone up here doesn't mean I wholeheartedly endorse their views. I just thought this was an interesting comment. Comedian Daniel Koss said, hey, you ever notice when someone says this neighborhood is really safe, they mean it's really segregated? And when he did that, there was just like crickets in the audience. He said, did that cut too close to home, Orange County? Yeah. Yeah. But it's again the same way that in many respects we have, we, we euphemistically talk about race, but without actually talking about race. Like we don't actually say, you know, and it gets back to the Hari Kondabola uh, point where it's like, no, 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 I'm not injecting race in the situation. It's already there. We just have to uncover the way that we're already talking about. And so really what happened, and again, I just like pop culture references, and you can go with me or not, but really what I like about it, this, this concept is it kind of accurately describes racism contemporarily. And that was from the usual suspect, and I can see by the age in this room, a lot of you are like, huh? But Kevin Spacey, before he was on House of Cards, played Kaiser Soze, or played Verbal Camp, whichever one you want to do, and he said the greatest trick the devil ever pulled was convincing the world he didn't exist. And in many respects, it's exactly why I have this talk, is that the greatest trick that racism pulls, and the reason why it persists on a systemic level today, is precisely because so many people, and in particular, so many white people, are convinced that it doesn't exist. And not only are they so convinced that racism doesn't exist, they will actually challenge people of color who say that racism doesn't exist, that they are misperceiving the world. And we'll get into unpacking all of that later on. So, you know, we have a lot of conversations about race, and one of the biggest difficulties that we have about these conversations is that they're so frequently derailed. And so often they're derailed because we don't remember, and I keep coming back to history, but we don't remember Dr. King. But let me put it a different way. We remember Dr. King extraordinarily selective. Okay? People tend to forget Dr. King scared the bejeebers out of the majority of Americans. He actually didn't even have a positive approval rating in the black community when he was assassinated. After he wrote, after he gave the speech, Why I Opposed the, the War in Vietnam, Time Magazine said that sounded like something from Radio Hanoi and not an American citizen. 
but we have what Cornell West refers to as the Santa Clausification of Dr. King. Yeah, he had a dream, and it was so racist back then, and look, he set us all free. And we forget that he was a social radical, probably would be considered a socialist nowadays, but everybody, because he's a safe public image, everybody and their mother is claiming his legacy. The right-wing commentator, Glenn Beck, actually used Dr. King's image in the introduction to his show a few years back before he got kicked off the air because he honestly believed that he was living Dr. King's legacy. And one thing that we continually forget, because everyone takes that idea out of context, that my wish that my daughters would be judged, not by the, my children would be judged, not by the color of their skin, but by the content of their character, that in some way Dr. King advanced colored blindness as a solution to society still. And absolutely not. Just get that out of your head. That is absolutely not what Dr. King advocated for in any way, shape, or form. And to find one sentence out of the thousands and thousands and thousands of, of lines that he wrote over his entire career and say that this is emblematic of, 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 his, of, of his legacy, I mean, that first of all, it's just inaccurate, it's bad, and it's also disrespectful to Dr. King's legacy. And so in many respects, that's what we need to do, is continue to have this conversation. That's why MLK Day, in many respects, is A, extraordinarily frustrating for me, but B, is so incredibly important, because the subsequent generations do, you know, they say, oh yeah, you know, we're gonna read I Have a Dream, and they stand up and they do it, and they have no connection to what that means contemporarily. And so we're getting to this issue of color blindness, and bringing it a little bit more to the present. And there's this really weird, conundrum that I have to deal with on a consistent basis in the work that I do on white people. Every available indicator shows that white people are privileged in society. White people perform better in society. White people are given systemic privileges in society. And it really doesn't matter what, what area you're looking at, whether it's education, economics, wealth versus income, life expectancy, infant mortality that there are still systemic ways where people of color are marginalized in these areas. So then, how do you reconcile that empirical reality on the one hand with the empirical reality that Norton and Summers determined on the other hand that says that as a whole right now, white people believe that anti-white racial discrimination is actually more prevalent than anti-black. It's a more pressing social issue. That's on the aggregate. How do we reconcile these two things? How is that possible? How can it be, how can a personal viewpoint be so far divorced from what's just a, a reality of everyday life, everyday existence? Well, in many respects, it does get to that issue of color blindness, and it becomes a matter of, of, of perception and misperception. That is, this is sort of the uh, visual of the way the society is structured. There are privileges associated with being white, which both elevate white people and depress the opportunities of people of color. However, color blindness says this in a different way. It says, no, really, you know, it, it, racism is just a few fringe members of the KKK that really doesn't represent society. There's really not that much racism, so we're all pretty much on equal footing. Then, when there's a race conscious social policy, which tend to be very modest, like people tend to forget that affirmative action was a compromise between left and right. It wasn't this radical leftist agenda that is portrayed as right now. It was very much like, no, we're, you know, let's kind of try to find a middle ground where left and right can agree or at least not kill each other and we'll push that forward. But now, because we're so far removed from that history, now when you have a very modest proposal like affirmative action, the gains of people of color become framed as the marginalization of white people. And again, part of that is the normality of whiteness. You start from the, oh yeah, we're just normal, we're all people, we're all on equal footing, not taking uh, into account the systemic and inequitable social uh, relations. Then when one group advances, you're like, oh my god, I'm, I'm getting hurt in the process. And then that really took hold when we had a black or technically biracial man as president, and also, and it, <laughs> Things have kind of broken loose on that. So, in some of the work that I do, it, I, in, in some ways, I don't actually know how to make sense out of all of this, but I still need to document it. And this was one of the students who I interviewed for my dissertation research. 
And so I asked them about affirmative action is completely opposed to it. And I asked them why. You know, how do you get your viewpoints? He said, you know, it's primarily an opinion derived from observation. We see different different businesses, primarily small businesses or franchises, that have probably majority staff and minority workers. And keep in mind, this isn't his line. Marginalizes white people, it hurts white people in the process. I said, Can you give me a good example? He said, Yeah, there's a local Burger King which appears primarily staffed by Latinos. I haven't yet seen, to my knowledge, but one white person there. But maybe there's somewhere I can't see. This is an absurd. I'm giving like cross eyes and you know, smack forehead, but this is really what he believed that affirmative action is bad for white people, it hurts white people. It's the same as reverse racism, reverse discrimination. Yet, his example is there's a local Burger King that only hires Latinos. And again, it gets that issue of, 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 of perception and misperception. Like he, he's, he's so embedded in his in his idea that, that that racism doesn't exist, except for the fact that it marginalizes white people, that he refuses to see, well, maybe it's because Burger King only hires low-income people and there's systemic inequalities, which makes it so that Latinos are on the lower rung of that spectrum. Not only just that group of Latinos working with Burger King hurts white people. And my eyes were back in my head and I had to keep going on the conversation. So, a lot of this talk, though, uh, focuses on, on, on whiteness and white privilege. And I want to unpack that term for a second. Because I use it, but I also find it problematic. And how many of you have either read or heard of Peggy McIntosh's Invisible Men? Okay. Yeah, it's a good it's a good primer jumping off point. You know, it, you know racism 101, it's okay. Um, but one thing that I that I started finding when I was <coughs> when I both engaged in these conversations as well as when I looked into the term is that the term privilege itself tends to derail racial conversations very quickly. And the simple example is, well, are you saying that the kids of Michael Jordan are not privileged relative to a white kid from Appalachia? It's like it's the most hackneyed response that I receive all the time, but it's very real. It, it, and first of all, it's not, it's an apples to oranges comparison. It doesn't make sense. It'd be, no, is, you know, a kid in a housing project on the east side of Chicago who's black privileged relative to the kid from Appalachia? That's a comparison, first of all. That aside, the term privilege does tend to imply a semi charmed life, you know, that I have it easy. And whether privilege is a very literal definition means that colloquially, in many respects, that's what it's taken to be. And so first of all, the term is frequently misapplied in that sense, and instead of actually being a method of engagement, is one that actually shuts the conversation down that it's supposed to start. Second of all, if we start looking at Peggy McIntosh's list, it gets back to what I said about what defines whiteness, that is, not being black. I am not followed through a store because people suspect me of shoplifting. I don't have people challenge the, uh, uh, my perceptions of my intelligence because of the color of my skin. It was all of these things that she didn't happen to her as a function of being white. And so in many respects, I actually I, I like the term immunity white immunity. Because really what she's talking about is sort of a basic standard of humane treatment of all people, that all people should be at, that, that people of color are, it's not that white people are so much elevated, but people of color are depressed and not allowed access to that on a society level. Now, I will say that because privilege, I mean, there's, there's so many hands to them, obviously we can continue talking about that because it's out there colloquially. People know what that term means. But it's pedagogically one thing that I use is I always like to have white immunity in my back pocket as a supplement to white privilege. But just a thought, we'll move on. So other manifestations of racism, because again, no one thinks of themselves as a racist, right? There's a very simple formulation that people forget. To be a racist is a bad thing. I am a good person, ergo, I am not a racist. Therefore, I could not have said a racist thing because only racist people say racist things. I am a good, you can see how there's sort of a sick of the logic in there. So in some of the, <coughs> in some of the people who I've interviewed, 
Um, I asked about uh, about uh, examples of racism on campus. I would ask, in particular, white men, what, where they saw examples of racism on campus. And so a lot of them said it was in joking, which already discursively downplays the relevance of racism. Because, hey, it's just a joke. It doesn't really matter. But I found a really interesting pattern of behavior that they were engaging in. And so first of all, you have up at the top, evidence of racism here on campus. People have noticed say the N-word like, uh, like heartedly and like in a joking manner, ha ha. Okay, so already my alarm bells are going on. I said, okay, this, uh, it's, it's, knowing this history and knowing that you're white, knowing this, this is, this is not exactly completely kosher, what are, and so let's unpack this a little bit. And so I started asking the students, well, you know, uh, do you tell these jokes? Is this joke, does this joking occur in front of minority groups? And I was stunned because the, the guys who I talked to actually said, no, it usually doesn't. You know, racial jokes, they probably happen more with a racial groups present. I don't know why. I think when it happens, there's, it's done with a certain level of confidence that it won't be misconstrued. That is, that among their primarily white racial friendship groups, that they could joke around racially and it wouldn't quote unquote be misconstrued. So then I would ask the obvious question, well, why would it be misconstrued? Why do you think it would be misconstrued? Why, what, what, what could possibly happen? And so they started, they, they, they consistently gave me this ideology that essentially uh, racial minorities are overly sensitive on issues of race. And one of them made the analogy to the, the playing the slug bug game. I don't know if you used to play it as a nerd kid, but it's, just, it's like that Volkswagen effect when, when you're looking for them on the road and when uh, you're looking for certain things, you start seeing them a lot more often than you than you would. And so again, it's one of these things. It's not that racial minorities are accurately seeing and describing racism, but that they're looking too much into it, the situation. Because I don't see it as an issue. It's really not an issue. And the thing is, is they never said it's not an issue for me. They would always say, it's not an issue universally. It's not an issue for anybody. And I mean, how presumptuous, or presumptuous would that be? I mean, like if I came up here and said, there really are no women's issues. We're all just human. I mean, they have to, that would be asinine as a man to say that. But that's exactly what they're saying along, uh, along the lines of race. And so really what happened is, I, 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 this is essentially the, um, I, I call it the cycle of rationalization. That you had, on the one hand, the behavior, the racial joking, but it was facilitated by these balkanized racial environments that had a lack of minority presence, but they were justified through an ideology that minorities are overly sensitive. And each one of those had to be in place in order for this to occur. So again, it's not just an individual action, but it was facilitated by each one of these areas. And if we go a little bit deeper on joking, joking is performative in nature. You tell a joke, you need an audience. You don't, it doesn't make sense to sit there and, you know, look in the mirror while you're brushing your teeth and tell a joke because then you laugh at yourself and then if someone saw you think you're nuts and it, it, that's just that's bad. Don't do that, you know? So and so it's not just that, but then you have to have a receptive audience to it. And all those things had to be in place in order to facilitate these uh, racist practices. And really racism has been documented frequently behind closed doors. Pete and they refer to it as backstage versus mm -hmm. front stage performance or two phase racism. I identified my cycle of rationalization, and even this comedian Doug Stanhope, who's a libertarian, uh, uh, he likes to say very provocative things, and so again, I can't go with them all the time, but he was critiquing his minority friends who said, you can't understand racism unless you're a minority, and he said, no, 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 you can't understand racism unless you're white. You can't understand racism if you're not white. Because I hear the stuff they say about you when you leave the room. They don't hold back on my account. I was like, wow, that's, that, that kind of stunned me. Because I was like, wow, um, that's kind of honest. So then it begs the question, what the heck do we do? Now, I want to be very clear about this. There is no one, two, three, silver bullet, you know, any, you know, if there was a formula for undoing racism, we would have done it all. That we just so just this is messy work. It's difficult work. It gets slapped really fast, and so I'm not only going to say some things that work, but also why they don't work. So it's more that you know there's sort of um, 
conditions necessary to make these work, which we'll try to work through. <coughs> so, cross-racial interactions can really help. That, and we already saw that in the racial joke. If you don't have a racially segregated environment, it's really hard to tell racial jokes that would offend somebody who's, 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 who's of the racial group that you're making fun of. But above and beyond that, and some of the people who I, uh, who I interviewed, they consistently talk about coming from very racially segregated high school environments and coming to college and being able to interact across difference for the first time in their life. And actually, instead of seeing race as just sort of numbers on the blackboard or see, you know, to show cops hunting down black people or you know, the, the, whatever sensationalized thing you see on, on CNN or Fox News or MSNBC, you, know, you could actually hear firsthand experiences. And he was just, it, 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 it shouldn't be so profound, but it really was for him. And he said, you know, but then talking with a friend of mine, she's a black female, she says she has to deal with race all the time. It's something she ha constantly has to deal with. And basically, he had sort of the, this moment of cognitive dissonance where he had to say, wow, either on the one hand, she's completely misunderstanding and misperceiving the world, or my own existence has led me to a false belief about society, and I need to start to self-interrogate a little. Now, does this mean every cross-racial interaction is going to come with this? No. But what I'm saying is that in, in, in reality, what, what a lot of these are going to have in common is putting a human face on racism. And that's really in part what she's doing here. She's saying it's not just this abstract concept. It's a very, very real thing in my life. And it's a very real thing in your life. You're just not aware. Now, some of the problems that arise from that. First of all, one of the biggest interpersonal forms of racism that still occurs is this thing called the microaggression. It's the subtle, frequently unconscious slights that have no racial intentional, no intentional racial animus associated with them, but are nonetheless still very relevant. And they continually remind you of where your place is on the social hierarchy. A very simple one that I continually received when I was uh, in high school here back in the late 90s was, you can't be that, you can't be Mexican, you're too smart. So you just sort of unpack that in its entirety, you know. I'm like, huh, so, I'm, you know, so either I have to choose between my, my Chicano roots or being student body president, because I can't be both in your mild viewpoint of what it means to be Latino. But again, no, you know, no racial animus, very unconscious. The people we're sitting there trying to say, well, you dang N word, it was it was, it was just a it, just the way that these are manifest. And why these are so insidious is that they have a cumulative impact. It's not just that I heard that at one time. You hear that consistently over and over and over and over again. And not only does that decrease academic achievement, it increases depression, decreases life expectancy from our friends over in public health. So, I mean, these are not just these innocuous, you know, basically, I, I hear this nonsense, well, sticks and stones may break my bones. If anybody is subject to this kind of detrimental treatment on a systemic level, they will suffer adverse effects. And Interpersonal interactions across race. There's also a social dy a dynamic that social psychologists Nicole Richardson and Nicole Shelton uh, have uncovered, which said, why don't they work? They wanted to know, why do these consistently fail? They said, well, on the one hand, people of color, students of color, are consistently required to be racial teachers. And, that's, and they spent all of their psychic energy just having to educate about issues of race. On the other hand, white people spend all their psychic energy trying not to appear racist. And when you're sitting there saying, don't be racist, don't be racist, don't be racist, you, you create an, an unintentional barrier to authentic, an authentic uh, uh, dialogue. So then you have the teacher trying to say, look, this is what's really going on. Don't be racist, don't be racist, what'd you say? And you, and you miss the whole thing. And I guess the last point of the burden of being racial teachers. That is that I love the idea that cross-racial interactions can help racially privileged students engage in their own unconscious racial biases. But at the same time, <coughs> you know, take some personal responsibility for it. It doesn't have to be that people of color are your racial teachers. 
especially, you know, like at the University of Arizona, we barely have, you know, like I think 20% Latinos on campus. If we expected those students to be the racial teachers to their white peers, that's what they're going to spend all their time doing, is running from white peer to white peer to white peer to be their racial teacher. That's exhausting. So, moving along, that we're engaging in these conversations. Now, I love this Cat Jason movie. If you don't know his blog, The Hill Doctrine, look it up. It's, it, it's cool, it's tight. He, he, he's a. Uh, does the uh, longest running hip hop show in New York City history called the Underground Railroad. He's a self described hip hop head and uh, nerd, and uh, he just, uh, I, I, I love his work. And so he had his probably his most famous work was called How to Tell People They Sound Racist. Because if you're engaging in these conversations, again, people don't think that they're being racist, so you're going to actually need to call them on at some point. And what he says is that you need. <coughs> To differentiate between action versus the person. If I come at you and say, man, you're a racist, immediately it becomes, well, how do you know what's in my heart? And how can we possibly see it? And I had no intention of doing that, and you have no business of saying my business is saying. Instead, he says, focus on the action. What you said, what you did, this thing in isolation we just saw here, that that was racist. And holding each other accountable for that. Because it doesn't necessarily mean that you're a bad person, it just means you made a mistake. And there's a huge issue with that, is that for whatever reason, when we have these racial dialogues, that people don't feel that they can make a mistake. And so, <coughs> I'm always reminded of the words of Bell Hooks, that for me, forgiveness and compassion are always linked. How do we hold people accountable for wrongdoing, and yet at the same time remain in touch with their humanity enough to believe in their capacity to be transformed? And in many respects, that's sort of what Jason was talking about in the sense of, you know, you did this one bad thing. Let's work on that. It's holding the potential for them to you know, correct in the future, to hold that, to actually regret having done it so you don't do it in the future. And at the same time, I'm reminded very much of Maya Angelou in the sense of that she talks very deeply about the issue of courage. And she says that courage is the most important of all the virtues because without courage you can't practice the other virtues on a consistent basis. And that gets back to the issues that I was talking about with the racial joking in the sense that in many respects the students who are talking to you, even if they kind of hinted that yeah this is kind of racist, they never had the courage to speak up and do anything about it. Well you know I just really, it was, you know, we're having a good time, we're having some drinks, it wasn't really that big of a deal. Well, if it wasn't that big of a deal, then A, you would have had it, you would have been telling these jokes in front of people of color, number one. And number two, it is a lack of courage that's really being displayed. And that's, in many respects, to engage in these dialogues is precisely what's needed. At the same time, I'm really reminded of Audre Lorde, but she said, uh, in the litany for survival, and when we speak, we are afraid, our words will not be heard or welcome, but when we are silent, we're still afraid. But basically, on either way, we're still afraid. Now, the last part, I mean, she's usually talking about oppressed communities, and so the last part doesn't necessarily apply because she talked about so it's better to speak remembering we're never meant we we're never meant to survive. Well, this is the flip side of it. This is the world where the folks we're talking about are specifically meant to survive, but at the same time, it doesn't mean that they're not experiencing fear and a lack of courage in the situation. And that's precisely why it's so important that those people who have access to the backstage performance, those people who are engaged in the science of public rationalization, those people who do have the ability to disrupt, have a moral responsibility to do precisely that. So, other things that can help address unconscious racial bias. One thing that really surprised me, and I wasn't, didn't see this coming as much, was the potential of, of being not minority racially, but a different kind of minority. For example, uh, gender minority, uh, sexual orientation minority, religious minority. And uh, there was this one, uh, this one student who wrote, who said it really well. Said, "I'm not a racial minority. I'm a minority in terms of being gay and sexual preference. So I can identify with these different racial groups. So maybe if I were straight and white, I wouldn't have, I would have a different opinion. And in many respects, what he was able to do, and through the course of our conversations, would say." 
I don't necessarily know what it means to be a person of color. I can't ever have actually experienced that. Just as many people of color can't know what it's like to be a gay man. But at least we can understand that we have something in common, and we can say that, you know, a victory in your community is a victory in my community, and vice versa. That that's a huge possibility there that's frequently left unrealized. All too often we get saddled off that it's either a women's issue or a black issue. It's either a Latino issue or a gay issue. And in many respects, we need to be able to think across those in more intersectional paradigms. Now, liabilities of this. Oh, there are lots of liabilities with this. Uh, first of all, that I don't want to essentialize and say that minority experiences are a panacea for everything. Pedagogically, they can work really, really well sometimes and say, look, you know, you're talking about people don't get it from your perspective. That's, that's how Peggy McIntosh wrote her piece. She said, as a feminist scholar, my male colleagues just don't get it. Then her women of colleagues back in the piece were like, yeah, but as a white woman, you don't get it. And she's like, oh my god, I, I don't get it. And there's greater possibility of making these connections and uh, making sort of analogous situations. But we don't want to overlook and valorize other marginalized communities because there's a lot of racism embedded within them. You know, Asian men are still feminized even within the gay community. But let's not overlook also that there's a lot of homophobia and sexism within communities of color as well. In addition, you don't want to make the eight prior assumption that just because somebody comes from a marginalized background that they necessarily believe that oppression exists. See Clarence Thomas, for example. Yeah, so um, <coughs> and at the end of the day, when we start talking about multiple forms of oppression, that sometimes we can fall into the trap of the oppression Olympics. The oppression Olympics is essentially that you know, that it's harder to be black than it is to be gay. It's harder to be gay than it is to be a woman. It's harder to be gay. You sort of get the idea. Of this. And I love what Petito Martinez and Angela Davis reminded us. I don't know if they necessarily coined the word. The, the history is a little fuzzy, but they're probably the most cited ones on it. But just keep in mind, there is no gold medal for winning the Oppression Olympics. It doesn't exist. So, and actually, in many respects, when we play the Oppression Olympics, there are only losers in the room. So just keep that in the back of your mind. <clears throat> Moving to curriculum and pedagogy, um, and this is this is one of the biggest areas of risk because we can sanction it as institutions of higher education, we can engage in American practice of students, um, and, and, and in many respects, it's one of the areas that we have the most the most control over. And I love this, uh, especially not just uh, I, I love this work of Paulo Freire and the pedagogy of oppressed, because he says looking at the past must only be a means of understanding more clearly what and who they are, so that they can build. So they more wisely build the future. And I, and I love that idea of, of that, you know, let's not just study history in the abstract. Let's actually make it mean something to the present. Let's actually try to find what, you know, it, it, it's like, I still remember that slogan, Tip a Canoe and Tyler Two. Mm -hmm. I don't even remember what gang war that was for. It, it, there's no, it, it's trivial, you know? Let's, let's understand the past so we can build a better future. And part of this calls for uh, the need for ethnic studies and curricular diversity. And uh, Ronald Kataki wrote directly about this in uh, his, his classic book, A uh, Different Mirror, where he said, what, what happens when to borrow from the words of Adrian Rich, uh, Adrian Rich, when someone with the authority of this teacher describes our society and you're not in it? Such an experience can be disorienting moment of psychic disequilibrium as if you looked into a mirror and saw nothing. And that's one of the critical reasons why it's so important to uncover why we in curriculum. That is that, you know, and, and it's not just specific to history, you know, in, uh, in higher ed, you know, our, 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 the, the seminal books are written by Ernie Pascarella, Vincent, so uh, 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 Pat Terenzini and, and, uh, and Sammy Aston. Sammy Aston, yeah. They're all four white guys, and, so, and they're all based on empirical studies of largely white, middle-class, male groups. But we just call that higher ed canon. We don't call that the white higher ed canon. It still made some amazing advances, and I don't want to throw the baby out with the bathwater. 
But at the same time, we need to realize that part of the reason why that is in existence is precisely because of male privilege, racial privilege, white privilege, et cetera, et cetera. And there is a need, as Ronald Zakaka talks about, to provide different mirrors in this process. However, not all diversity is created equally because we have the possibility of doing sort of tokenizing diversity. Heroes and holidays, booze and fiestas. Hey, Cinco de Mayo came up and we celebrated Mexican Independence Day. Oh wait, it's not Mexican Independence Day. <laughs> yeah, it, and, and thinking that we're being meaningfully inclusive. That's, that's not it. One of the students who I, I talked to said, uh, this one professor, it wasn't even in the course content, but just in his approach, that he would take these abstract numbers but then make it very real on a concrete level in class. How does this affect this person right here, this group of people right here? And he said he would affirm the dignity of people who we might think of were lesser because they would live in, in substandard conditions. And that gets back exactly to what I was talking about, about interpersonal interactions, that fundamentally what we're talking about, what we're talking about interacting with a person, interacting pedagogically, is a humanizing pedagogy. It's too easy to say that race is this problem out there. It's how are we going to collectively deal with it as a human community. And don't misconstrue it and say, well, you know, human, we're all human. And, yeah, I get that, okay? But these differences matter. This also gets back to Jay Smooth, part two, where he did his one blog on, <coughs> on how you tell people to sound racist. And then he got a lot of feedback where he said, but gosh, I tried it and it didn't quite work. So he did a TED talk where he talked about how, how to racially listen. And we don't talk about that very much. We talk about dialogue, which always says, oh, well, I'm talking, I'm talking, I'm talking, you're talking, you're talking. But we don't actually talk very much about how we listen or don't listen to each other. And I, I, I like the metaphors that he uses um, because he says that he, all too often when it comes to issues of race, we have a console model. It's like, well, no, you know, I had my racism removed in 2005. I, I had much crash, and we, you know, we're all good. You know, hey, you know. And he says, instead, what we need to do is reconceptualize of race and anti-racism, in particular, as a social practice, more akin to a dental hygiene model. That may sound silly, but his metaphor makes sense in, in, in that. You wouldn't have, you know, you wouldn't walk up to somebody and I say, oh, hey man, you got something stuck in your teeth, and all of a sudden you're like, but I'm a clean person, and you know, I have good hygiene. How could I possibly have something stuck in my teeth? And he, he made the case that with respect to race, we have this weird discursive way of if you're not batting a thousand, you're batting zero. If I did something racist, I must be a racist and go all the way to that end. It's like, no, 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 no. Again, in many respects, this is a humanizing pedagogy. That means that your friend was had the courage to overcome the social obstacles of actually telling you that you did something racist, respects you enough as a person to do that, and thinks that you have the potential to grow as a person as a result of it, that that is actually one of the greatest expressions of humanity that could be in existence, instead of taking it as a personal affront. And so what he says is that, you know, we just need to listen more carefully when someone says that we have something racist stuck in our teeth. So just take that for what it is. So this speaks very much to the importance of allyship, speaking of, and taking action. But first and foremost, I always start with disrupting personal ignorance. And I don't mean running out, reading the invention of the white race, and saying, okay, I am here, I know. Actually, what I mean by disrupting personal ignorance is actually engaging in the process of figuring out how much you don't know. Because the second that you say, oh, I'm an expert, is the second that you're probably going to start failing again. I love the way that one of my old professors used to frame it. He says, the expert is just the person who's a little less ignorant than everybody else. It's important to generate social criticism, especially if you are of a privileged group. You have a greater moral responsibility because you have access, and you also have greater systemic privileges, which also means you have greater possibility 
of changing systemic reality. 